Hey, I'm Alon Rubin. Right now we're going to be diving into the session of my first solo single, Talk, Talk, Talk. A little bit about the track before we get started. It was mainly engineered by Carlos de la Garza at his studio, Music Friend. I say mainly because I did the drums, bass, guitar, and some of the piano at his place in about a four to five hour period. And then I did the rest of the engineering poorly in this studio for my vocals, harmonies, percussion, and small additional overdubs like fuzz guitar and things like that. It was then mixed by Aaron Rubin, who, as you could have imagined, is my brother. And a couple of things about why I wrote this song, where my head was at the time of composing it. First things first, I was very excited to start writing music on this piano to my right when I first received it. I was in that headspace of, of writing something a bit more traditional. So I wanted to make sure that the song had a sort of classic feel to it, drums, bass, guitar, piano, vocals, and then the production was something that was very important to me because at the time, and still actually, I'm very annoyed that music has become so production driven and I feel like the craft of songwriting has really taken a backseat to weird sounds, production tricks, whatever happens to be trendy at the time. And uh, I really think that all that stuff should be used to enhance the song, not support the song almost entirely. So I wanted to make sure that all of the production that went into this song, and there's a lot, was done in a more traditional or classic sense, whatever you want to call it. It relied heavily on my vocals, tons and tons of harmonies, vocal stacks, and then some orchestration, the bridge, and the rest of it just being dynamic in the way I played everything and the way I built the track and kind of laid out the whole dynamic trajectory of the whole thing. So I should also point out that this isn't the actual mix session. This is a committed session that I try to organize in a way that would make it easier for me to navigate for the purposes of this video. I committed buses, I'm missing some plugins, so it's not gonna sound identical, but for what we're trying to achieve here, it's plenty good. So let's listen from the top through about the first verse. In that very short amount of time, you can see that the song shifted pretty dramatically from a nice sort of dreamy quality to an angsty kind of pompous dynamic and then brought back down into that more dreamy quality. So what we're looking at here are piano, vocal, bass, drums come in eventually. And then, of course, a very lush vocal stack, which we'll take a look. So I guess the first thing I want to point out here is that the bass, although very subtle, is doing something very important. I didn't feel like the track felt full enough, even in this very bare intro. I felt like I needed something a bit more. So I kind of channeled my inner McCartney or John Deacon and played very high register on the bass, which is not something I usually do. And it's not really holding down root notes. It's almost following bits and pieces of the melody. And it's throwing in some fourths in there and fifths to give a semblance of, of where the actual chord is. But let's take a listen to that without the vocals. So that achieved that purpose of adding just a little bit more rhythm. And as you could tell from the intro or that very first verse to when I kind of get back into that verse, I went to a lower register, which kind of makes it feel as if the track is starting to build. The drums come in 
in that heavier part, I believe right here, the B minor to the F sharp major. So of course, when it drops back down, the vocal stacks come in. So I'm gonna have to scroll all the way down until I find them. And here is the opened fold track folder. So you can see everything. I, I'm not gonna go ahead and count, but it looks like, yep, 16 tracks. I generally like to quadruple each harmony if this is the kind of sound that I'm going for. If I'm singing a regular harmony to say a lead vocal, I'll probably just double it, sometimes even just do one one pass of it. But I feel once you get into a third and a fourth track, you start getting that kind of phasey, lush, almost pad sound. So you make it 16 and you get something fun like this. <laughs> There you have it. Those harmonies are basically mimicking exactly what the piano is doing. We're playing an F sharp major, then I drop to major seventh, seventh, and that's what the vocals are doing. So let's go ahead and dive into the pre chorus when the rhythm kind of starts becoming far more prominent, some percussion comes in, and now the song feels like it's becoming more driving. I have to So that's the pre-chorus, and to kind of add to the intensity, aside from what the lead vocal is actually doing, the song kind of shifts to more of a B minor, and it kind of keeps moving on down. But aside from the vocal intensity in the lead vocal increasing, we then have a harmony to the lead vocal for the first time in the song, and those a cappella are the following. Lie after lie after lie. Giving my mind a black eye Always pushing the end of the line It's no surprise Very large vocal stack. I don't think it's any mystery where the inspiration for that came from. But once again, just sort of highlighting the chords. Then we have the first introduction of my fine friend, the snare drum that leads us into the chorus. So that's the chorus, talk, talk, talk. Lead vocal, main harmony to the vocal. It really picks up in mood, although it, it goes to a, a more E major feel. It's still a bit melancholy in the melody, and I'll dive into why that is a bit later, because as each chorus happens in the song, I add different elements, and by the time we get to the final chorus, those melancholy elements are really almost at the forefront. So we have some pianos that pick up here. So I have a second piano that comes in, some acoustic guitars, tambourine, a bunch of good stuff, but let's go ahead and listen to the pianos. We have the main piano, and then we have a second almost tack piano feel, and you'll hear them playing off of each other. They're not playing the exact same thing. You have the main piano that's kind of really just holding down the chords on the quarter notes, and then that almost saloon-sounding piano comes in. And really what I wanted out of that was more of a percussive, very harmonically rich high-end. 
I wouldn't be surprised if you didn't even notice it was there, but that happens a lot with, with in-depth productions. It takes a lot of listens to kind of peel all the layers, and that's why we're doing this right now. I personally love discovering new things in songs that I've heard plenty of times. So adding to the instrumentation that's already been there, guitars come in for the first time. Just acoustics for now, and those are doing the following. So nothing too exciting there in terms of guitars, but they're then filling out the harmonic spectrum. They're adding something new, so it feels like things are constantly moving forward. And structurally, I never set out to do anything specific when I'm writing a song. I don't think, okay, my structure's going to be intro, verse, pre-chorus, chorus, whatever it may be. I do start writing very often from the beginning, and that sort of dictates where I feel the song should go. Everything we've heard so far was written in that same order. I started with the intro. I thought, ooh, I want to go to this minor bit, but bring it back. All right, now let's move to more of a, a let's move to a darker place and build some momentum there and then get into the chorus. So surprisingly, for whatever reason, I didn't feel like the chorus was enough for what had been there. Now, that doesn't mean I don't really like the chorus or think that the chorus is strong in itself, but I felt like the music needed to keep shifting and developing before coming back to the intro or the verse. So I then went to this post-chorus, and that sounds like this. So there you go. By the time I get to the end of that section, it feels like, okay, now it's time to loop back around to that F sharp major. Some electric guitars come in for the first time, not really doing anything prominent, but kind of filling out and doubling what my right hand is doing on one of these piano parts. A dirtier guitar did come in there, and actually sounds dirtier when it's solo than it does in the mix. And that really happens often because you may have an idea as to what a track should sound like, but for whatever reason, it's not poking out in the mix. So you do things that you either don't expect to do or don't necessarily, don't necessarily sound great by themselves, but in the mix, they are obviously fulfilling their purpose. Let's go ahead and jump to verse 2. There you have it. So very short verse. It's actually shorter than the intro in that verse. I don't do that B minor section and bring it back down. It kind of just recaps what was established at the beginning of the song and then gets in the pre-chorus. And the pre-chorus does introduce two new elements, one being uh, these DI fuzz guitars, which is something that I love to do. I love the sound of a DI fuzz. I believe I use the JHS color box. Now, that's not necessarily a fuzz per se, but when you distort the shit out of it and run in DI, it serves the same purpose. And that sounds like this. <laughs> You get 
at the point. I love that sound, and I use it a lot. Uh, not necessarily in this song, but just across a lot of what I do. And I actually blend that in with amp sounds as, as well because the harmonic content just really pokes through and makes things sound a bit richer. We also had some claps come in, which add to the intensity of the beat. So play a few bars of that. When we get to the end of this pre-chorus, we use the same harmonies. And when I say we, I mean me, of course. But... They are sung with more gusto, and rather than just playing through those last two chords before the drum fill that goes into the chorus, I did these two crashes on the E major and the A major. Once again, no surprise where the influence for that would have come from, but here's what that vocal stack sounds like. Let's come alive! Now, let's add the lead vocal and the accompanying harmonies to the lead vocal, you'll hear the fullness of the stack. Because you can tell that actually didn't sound very satisfying because some of the main voices were missing. So I approach harmony based on obviously what the lead vocal is doing, what the main harmony be beneath that may be, and then highlighting the rest in the octave below and above as far as I can go in either direction. And that sounds like this. Of the light, let's come alive. So that makes more sense when you listen to it with the lead, its harmony, and then the stack beneath it. And this is really uh, a sort of hint as to what's to come because the song has not reached its dynamic climax yet. But let's go out of chorus two, through the pre-chorus, into the bridge. So, out of that second post-chorus, I really make a moment out of that diminished chord, and sort of key change happens, but I highlight that diminished chord with one of my favorite vocal stacks that I love to do, which is building up diminished intervals, and that sounds like this. <sighs> and obviously hearing a vocal stack with diminished chords and that kind of breathy execution that then crescendos of course one can't help think uh about my one of my heroes good old freddie mercury but that's one of those things i i love learning from my heroes and whatever it is that i love but i think what's crucial is learning how to apply that to something that is still your own i never understood the trying to be or trying to rip off it doesn't make any sense to me but Everybody pulls from somewhere. I'm sure Freddie learned what he learned from other things. Uh, I know the Beatles learned plenty from others. But you take what you know, and you make something new out of it. So anyway, this diminished chord then brings us into the bridge, which will be the dynamic climax of the song. So let's go from right before into bridge A, because there are two bridges to this song. A lot of stuff going on here. So we have all the instrumentation from before, including the DI fuzz guitars. We have the introduction of two and then three different choir groups, and then brass. So let's listen to what these choir groups are doing, and you'll hear how they continue to build. And then I'll show how the 
the brass is enhancing what's going on harmonically with the the progression and the melody with the vocals. So just going into the bridge. <sighs> Lots of vocals. I mean, if I if I open up these folder tracks, it just keeps going and going and going. You get stuff like this when you're stacking these parts that don't necessarily sound great by themselves. I mean, let's let's take a listen to this. see how the distribution of these parts and how they build has it make sense but when you're layering these parts I dread to think or when I'm layering these parts I dread to think of whatever anybody thinks who may be able to hear me doing it but anyway let's have these vocals here and then we'll get into the introduction of brass now one thing I want to point out about the brass here is these are not real players this is MIDI stuff I use Spitfire for most of my orchestration stuff, and I love it. But what was tricky about this is that what I thought would be the best sounding libraries did not end up working well within the context of this track. Their stuff is very realistic and it's very malleable. But when you have these lush reverbs or room mic recordings of air studios or whatever it may be, it's not exactly gonna work with wherever I've recorded this stuff. So what I had to do was do everything over again in terms of getting them to very dry libraries. And I used studio, studio brass. And it's split up into horns low and high. Now I did, uh, I, I use the terminology low and high for the sake of organizing the tracks, but we have tubas, we have horns, bass, trombones, trumpets. And to be honest, they don't sound that satisfying, completely dry. But what matters is how it sounds in the mix and how it then starts meshing with everything when you run everything through a, the same reverb, the same sort of ambience, and put it all in the same figurative space. So for the low stuff, we have the following. So no mystery that those are not, in fact, real horns or real people performing them. Then these second, the second group comes in. Now it sounds kind of funny by itself, but it's all a matter of how it plays against the bass line the fuzz guitars, which are in the same sort of sonic space as these horns. And although you can't really detect that level of detail within the mix, there is something that makes you think this is, th there's something different in this section of the song that I haven't heard yet. And I actually just realized that there are bass trombones in the horns high section, so that was not organized very well. But anyway. We then move from bridge A into bridge B. Now, bridge A, instrumental bridge, bridge B, vocal bridge. And that sounds like this. Okay, so the vibe is brought down and to kind of really lay into the sentimentality or the, the sappiness of it, strings were introduced. And they are performing the following part. Now 
there you have it. Kind of a nice little tribute to George Martin, or at least that's what I had in my mind as I was writing those strings. Now, these have a bit more realism than the brass, but still not necessarily there until you then run it through the reverb, and then it kind of blends with everything nicely. So, that moves us from bridge A to bridge B into the final chorus. Now, the final chorus, as I stated earlier, does incorporate almost all of the elements that we've heard so far, with the exception of the fuzz guitars and the brass, but the strings are there with Mellotron strings, and they add to the melancholy element in this song. And it's funny how you may not feel that when you're listening to it, but when you start soloing out all this stuff, different different shades of it come out, different tones come out. So if we go to the chorus three, let's listen to it and then I'll kind of break down what it's comprised of. Okay, obviously sounds very similar to the two choruses before it, but what I'm going to do right now is solo the vocals. I'm going to solo the strings with the addition of the Mellotron strings, and I will bring in some other elements, but I want you to notice how it just has a completely different vibe without the drums, bass, guitar, so on and so forth. And these are the elements that make it feel different to the two choruses before it. Talk, talk, talk has never been so cheap. I can't remember half of what I hear. And time keeps ticking and it's been a sweet and so we wave goodbye another year. <sighs> There's a difference in some of the vocal phrasing, which adds to the the emphasis in this third chorus but let's start bringing in some other stuff and you'll see how it you'll see how it's built upon what has come before it talk, talk, talk has never been... instantly with the piano and guitars i believe it does not feel nearly as sappy talk, talk, talk has never been so Exactly the same part of the song, but even though these things aren't as present as they are when I'm soloing them, these are the sorts of subtleties that give repeated sections of songs a slightly different vibe and kind of highlights a different character in there. So things do continue through the final post chorus. We have the addition of some very staccato cello stuff, and I will play that with bass drums and piano so you can get a feel for how the cello or the celli if you will because i do think there are two of them are playing off of the bass just want to make sure i have all my tracks here because i'm losing track <laughs> My cello skills are not up to par to be able to play that, so those are indeed programmed. And once again, when you hear them by themselves, it's almost a little discomforting because it's almost overly staccato because I had to program it that way to make sure that it cut through the mix. If I had the luxury of, of a cellist nailing that for me over and over and over again, that would have been a different story. But that's what I did in this room. So after, or at the end of this post-chorus, we have one more indulgent section where rather than that diminished chord 
leading us back into the final verse or the outro, I wanted to really build on it one last time before kind of pulling the rug out from the under, from, from under the song. So let me just find that. Actually, before we get to that outro section, the final post-chorus also has some additional backing vocals that I just remembered, so let's listen to those. Let's turn the page out, close the book. We can shut our eyes or take another look. So we have this final colossal vocal pad here, more diminished fun. Kind of intricate to sing, actually, because when you're layering on harmonies and you're getting the different, the different sections of the chord or the different intervals of the chord, and they're moving melodically, they aren't things that you would usually sing. So it takes a little bit of practice, but let's listen to this final stack by itself before the, the real final stack comes in to kind of tie a bow on the whole thing. Ooh, ah. All right, there you have it. Diminished motion upward. A lot of fun. I love the sound of it, but in that register, it didn't get to where I needed to go. So I added this final one, which will you will hear come in. These ahs. Ooh, ah. More diminished fun, higher registers. There you go. Thank you, Roger Taylor, for the inspiration. All right, so then we get to our outro, which is pretty much a final verse. And I could be wrong, but this may be the first time that I've actually bookended a song. I don't usually end with a verse. I'm not sure I've ever done it, but once again, I wrote what I wrote, and this just felt like the natural way to bring this song to its conclusion. So let's listen. All right, well, there you have it. That is Talk, Talk, Talk. I hope you guys enjoyed this deep dive into the session. I personally love seeing this sort of stuff with my favorite artists and musicians, so I hope you enjoyed it as well. If you have any questions, leave them below. Let me know. Perhaps I'll do this on future music, and hopefully you gained a different appreciation for the song or heard stuff that you hadn't heard before. So thanks for watching. Go stream the song wherever you stream your music and enjoy it. You're going to hear new things. I'm sure I forgot to mention part of what was in the session, but go listen. Thank you very much. <laughs>